Muchísimas gracias, profesora Cortina. Thank you very much, Professor Cortina. And now for something completely different. Our next speaker has spent his life exploring the origins of the universe. We're talking about the American physicist George Smoot. He received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2006 for his discovery of the black body shape and the anisotropy of the cosmic microwave background radiation. In other words, his studies demonstrated the existence of irregularities in the early universe shortly after the Big Bang that were the origin of the subsequent formation of galaxies. He is currently Professor uh, Emeritus at the University of Berkeley in California, Director of the Center for Basic Physics at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, as well as President of the Center for Cosmological Physics at the Laboratory of Astroparticles and Cosmology at the University of Paris. Moreover, since 2020, uh, he has had a close relationship with San Sebastian since he is actually affiliated with the DIPC and the title of his lecture is uh, Cosmology Today. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let us give a warm welcome to George Smooth. Let me see if I can get my computer started. But first, I want to, if I can get it started, I want to say uh, what a treat, what a great success having the you know, passion for knowledge event here. I've started a long trip, started almost three weeks ago, going to China for a world forum on conversion to energy. And I was tired when I got here, but I couldn't miss any of the talks. I couldn't miss any of the things. So I want to thank Pedro and all the staff and even the translators, oops, I'm too slow to do that. And then I want to thank my colleagues at the IAPC who made my life interesting, and Ricardo, who made my life a lot easier. And so, thank you to everyone. And uh, I wish that we had ah, more time to talk, you know, after these meetings. Okay, I think, I think I'm almost there. <laughs> okay, so I changed the title a little bit to Cosmology Today and the Future, because I want to think about a couple of things we're going to be looking at in the future. And uh, we're talking about the creation of everything and the making of everything right up to the present day, and the ability to project into the future what we think might happen. And uh, it's ambitious uh, kind of thing to do, but we're very lucky because when we go back in the early universe where it could be much more complicated, it, it actually simplifies in a lot of ways, and that's allowed us to make a tremendous amount of progress. And so we'll talk briefly about the formation of space-time, the evolve of what's going on, the universe becoming transparent, and then eventually the first generation of stars and galaxies, and then much more advanced things, including planetary systems and life and so forth. All of that's part of what's going on. And this is progress we've made over the last hundred years, basically. And unfortunately, I've been around for a lot of the last hundred years, so I've actually seen a lot of it happen. Okay, so I want to talk about how how we started to make the transition to cosmology. And it actually goes back to some of the ethical philosophers, including whom. That is, there was a speculation that we lived in an island universe, that we lived in a galaxy, and the galaxy had various groupings of stars and so forth, but it was just this big agglomeration, and outside of it was nothing. Well, Edward Hubble gets credit, although uh, he had help, including uh, the work here, by Henrietta Swan Leavitt. Um, he did a set of studies over a time period, uh, 1923, 1924, so basically 100 years ago, right? And he studied the Andromeda Galaxy, what we now call the Andromeda Galaxy. It was called the Andromeda Nebula in those days. And he discovered there were these pulsating stars called Cepheid variables. And he measured the pulse frequency and their apparent brightness. Henry Leavitt had shown 
that there was a very tight correlation between the period of a, of a Cepheid variable and its absolute brightness. And he was then able to use that to prove that Andromeda galaxies was 2.3 million light years away from our own galaxy, much further away than the other stars that are in our galaxy. Clearly, it's a whole nother island universe, and that was the beginning of extragalactic astronomy. But then we started seeing a lot of progress. So first I'm going to talk about the redshift, because this is the second thing that Hubble did, and he created the first universal law, namely the universe is expanding in a linear way. And uh, so what do we mean by the redshift? What we mean is, if we look at things that are far away, the lines that we normally see in stars or in galaxies move towards the red wavelength. That is, they're stretched to longer wavelengths. And Hubble assumed that meant the galaxies are moving away from us. Now we think space itself is stretching and stretches, since light is spread over a reasonable way, actually stretches the wavelength of the light out. And in fact, it could be a combination of three possible ways where there's a redshift, there's a gravitational redshift, there's a universal stretching redshift, and there's a velocity redshift. And I'll show you something on that, we know what's going on. So he made that plot with that limited data, he made this universal law. Well, this is a bad example for students because he was right. And so here's the evidence. So on the left here, is a tube filled with hydrogen gas and electric discharge going through it. So it's like a, a neon bulb or the old-time fluorescent bulbs that then had a coating on it. it. It glows, it excites the hydrogen atoms, and the hydrogen atom glows. But instead of being a continuous color, it's a series of lines. And so you see the lines. There's a, this one is lime and alpha line, lambda, beta, so forth. Because they didn't have a lot of imagination in those days. That's 100 years ago. And you can see that. And that's very characteristic. It's, it's the set of lines. If you see them, you know you have hydrogen. And it's also telling us that atoms, there is, atoms exist, and they're quantized. Well, atoms had sort of just barely been established, but there was a fight still going on. But this is really, really clear. And later on, it turns out there were three lines. There's the, you know, the Lyman series, the Belmer series, and so forth. These are thought to be in the, in the case of the, uh, the Lyman series, electrons coming from a high energy state in the hydrogen atom and dropping into the lowest energy state, right? And so the nice things are, they're this, the energies of the states are just quantized coming out. So you get this, you get a kind of stuff. And actually it's one over n squared minus one over m squared, and you get a whole, whole set of things. And that means you can design the whole kind of thing. But the thing that went on, this is the beginning of us trying to understand quantum mechanics. So that's why in the 20s, in the 1920s, quantum mechanics made these huge developments because these things were being seen. And in fact, helium was discovered in the sun by its lines before it was ever discovered on the Earth, and then people went and looked for it and found it. And so, but the other thing that I wanted to point out is, if you look at each line really carefully, you will see it's often split into two lines. That is, if the hydrogen atoms happen to be in a magnetic field, like the Earth's magnetic field or the stronger magnetic field on the Sun, the electrons have a spin and a magnetic moment, and that causes a little energy shift from an electron up or electron down. Electrons only in one of those two states. This is what we're talking about when we do quantum computing kinds of things. And so you see that, and you ramp up the electric the magnetic field, and you see the thing split apart. But you see it's there. So now you understand it at a deeper level. But if you look, there's even another level lower called the hyperfine, which is, has to do with whether the nucleus is spin up or spin down. And that's a multiple kind of things. So already in studying these lines and helping, you know, be making a tool for astronomers, physicists were beginning to understand the true nature of atoms and therefore the true need for quantum mechanics. But let me go back now to having a look. So here is the Orion Nebula. You can see this with your naked eye if you know exactly where to look, but with a binoculars or telescope, it comes very clear. It looks a little orangish, but it, this is a black and white picture. You see hydrogen lines, and you can measure, you can measure the redshift. 
But if you look at something a little further away, here's another galaxy. You see the arrow pointing to it. And you'll notice that line has shifted, right? You see the line there, you see the line here. The line has shifted to the red. And to the red, I don't mean it goes right to the red line, it shifts to longer wavelengths. And if you look at a galaxy that's further away, you see the line has shifted again, right? You can see it's further away because it's a much smaller galaxy, much phaser. You Hubble picked those galaxies based on what type he thought they were and thought they, were some, they should be similar in terms of brightness and so forth. And if you look at one that's even further away by apparent size, you see the line shifted further to the red. And you can go pretty far with this, right? Here you are, you know, so much that one of the lines is off, to, off the edge of the, of the thing. And you, you can do it even further, and you see galaxies that are hardly visible with the big telescopes that we had in this time. Well, <coughs> even though, so this is original data, it was shown in a talk, while well, other, but I found out the, the speaker had read my book, and I had dug up the original Hubble data to see whether he was justified or not. He, he either did it just individual galaxies or groups of galaxies. That's when there's two sets of, of data on there. It's really pretty shoddy, but he interpreted it as the Doppler effect, that the galaxy's moving away, shift things to the red. Now we interpret it as a, the red shift from the growth of space. And there's a little bit of wiggling around called the peculiar velocities that, that, that affects that. But if you look on the right side, you see we've made a little progress since Hubble. Now, as you go out to further redshift, you realize that a sun has a nice sort of black body spectrum. If you go to the, and it shifts to the red, if you didn't change your filter, you'll see something slightly different, so you have to correct for that. So on the, in the right hand, on the vertical axis, you'll see there are some extra corrections and so forth to take care of it. But you see the data points, and you see a smooth fitted line through it for, for the Hubble law, and you see the difference between that line and the data points in the bottom. We have gone out to this point to a, a, a redshift, which is on the scale of one. That's with Hubble, we got a lot of data. Now, I'll show you a little bit later, we have the James Webb Space Telescope. We're going out to redshifts as far as eight. So what's the redshift of one? The universe is half the size it is now. Redshift of eight, a ninth the size, or tenth the size we have now. So it's, we're probing out with our telescopes. Some of us, I'll tell you, we probed in from looking at the beginning of the universe. So we have this idea of how there was a beginning of time. This is the hardest thing I ever have to teach students, that the idea that time doesn't go infinitely far in the past. <laughs> they can't believe that time just might start. It's, it's a very hard thing to, to agree. But at some time, time, and also space, because Einstein told us they're in intermixable. At some time, there was the beginning of time and the beginning of space. And that was a very early time. And that's a period that we call inflation in Spanish and in, uh, in English. And uh, 380,000 years later, 379 here, we have the point where the universe becomes transparent. The way, when you look at the sun, the surface of the sun is opaque. You can't see inside the center sun. You can see to a surface, which is where it's an ionized gas, and it gets thick enough that it scatters the light, and you only see the surface of the sun. You see sunspots, you see things like that. The universe is the same way, but it's in time, not in space, because early on, we were all in a fireball. We were all in a place that was hotter than the sun, and it was pretty uniform everywhere. And then as the universe expanded and time went on, when we get to the 379,000 years, the universe suddenly becomes, very quickly becomes transparent, and the light from that early fireball is free to travel throughout the universe. And that's a really key thing, and it's something that, that I began to understand early on, uh, quite some time ago, and began to do a set of experiments. And after that, there have got to be galaxies and clusters of galaxies and other interesting objects. One of the questions that you would have is, how does a fluffy thing like a galaxy survive through the fireball? That's a really serious problem, right? I mean, 
you need something uh, complicated and tricky. And we have an idea how that works. So I'm going to show you in the next slide. Uh, this is sort of the keynote of what I did. These are, these are on, the, on the left, are two plots. Well, it's one plot and three plots that I made just over 30 years ago. And I was really proud of it at the time, and it got a lot of press. And the first one is measurements of the intensity of the radiation as a function of the wavelength of the radiation. Or in this case, I put it in terms of frequency because I'm a physicist, not an astronomer. So we believe in energy rather than in wavelength. And um, you will see it has this nice ramp going up. It's going up with the square of the frequency until it gets up high near what's the peak, and it curls down. This is exactly what Frank predicted. A black body radiation curve, a, a, you know, a, a Planckian curve should be uh, back in his paper in 1901. And what this tells you is two things. It tells you the early universe was very hot and very dense, and it was in thermal equilibrium. That is, it was like being inside of a star. And you go further back, it gets that way. Now, that's interesting. So my acquaintance, Stephen Hawking, based on airborne, first, first we did mountaintop, and then we did an airplane born, and then we did balloon borns. Based on that early data, he had been working uh, with George Ellis and made this, this, what we call the singularity theorems. He said, we now have enough data that this radiation that we see coming from the early universe is sufficiently uniform that you can extrapolate it back by more than a factor of a thousand. And as soon as you can get back to about 10,000, the energy density from the radiation, because it gains by the volume, right, which is the cube of the extrapolating back, plus you get a boost in the temperature as it goes back. It gets, it, it get the, gets blue shifted, it gets made hotter. There is then enough energy density in the radiation itself to force the universe back to a singularity. So this was like, you know, this was finally we had enough data that actually made that argument airtight, but it was pretty close to right, but he jumped the gun and so forth. So the big issue here is this first plot, the orange looking plot, is shows how incredibly uniform the universe is. And by incredibly uniform, I mean it's more uniform in all directions than the Earth is. You look at the Earth, it looks like a sphere, but it bulges slightly because it's rotating. It bulges, you know, roughly on the, on the well, I've got to go to kilometers, roughly 20 kilometers on the scale of 6,000 kilometers, right? So it's one over 300. This is one, we're going to see, much, more than, much better than one in 1,000. So it is, it is extremely uniform, so roughly one in 10,000, and it's really quite spectacular that how is it possible for the universe to be the same in all directions? I mean, wh what made things set up? What made it come out like that? If we take this very uniform, beautiful sky and we blow up the contrast, we see the second figure. And this second figure has two features in it. Across the horizontal axis is the galactic plane of our galaxy. It's a big disk like a CD, or I don't know what, whether people have any, anything like that. We used to say 78 record, but nobody has, <laughs> has records anymore. It's a, but it's, it's a very flat and messy thing. It, we, we live in a disk galaxy with just a little bit of bulge in the center. And it shows up there, and what you see is two spots very clearly, which is the spiral arm. We're in a spiral arm far out from the center of the galaxy. And if you look in one direction, you see down the spiral arm, it looks brighter. And if you turn and look in the opposite direction, you look down the spiral arm the other way. That's why there's two spots. And then you see the galactic center in the middle. But the other thing you see is a variation of roughly a part in a thousand that goes from warm up in that direction to cold down in that direction. That, I claimed at the time, well, before that, because I discovered it with the earlier experiments, is the motion of the solar system relative to the frame, we call the zero momentum frame of the, of the photons. I don't want to get into arguments about rest frames or whatever. It's a zero angular momentum for the radiation from the beginning of the universe. 
presumably, if there's a preferred frame for the universe, that would be it. But that's a whole second set of arguments. So we know that part of the redshift or blue shift is due to the fact that there are some motions. The galaxies are orbiting around other galaxies, and there's some motions. Here, we're being attracted much more than people had thought, because this happens to be counter to the direction the galaxy is rotating, and they were going around the galaxy. And so the whole galaxy has to be moving at almost 2,000 to speed of light. That requires a really massive object in the neighborhood in order to do it. So that was a, a, a controversy that went on with the astronomers for a while, but the physicists all agreed that it was um, the Doppler effect. But by this time, it became our calibration because it's there, we know it was there, and the equipment were so good, we could see the motion of the Earth around the sun, which is a 10,000th the speed of light. We could see that mod annual modulation and use that as an absolute calibration. And that's what we do in future experiments. So the great discovery from 10 years before is now the calibration of this, of this time. And then finally, if you remove that dipole and blow the scale up another factor of 100, now the galaxy is saturated. It looks all red across the center. But if you look away from the plane of the galaxy, you see some regions that are blue and some regions that are, that are sort of yellow and red and so forth. Those are the very largest scale structures you see in the universe. Those are things that we were able to demonstrate were primordial. They were there at 379,000 years. Now, it doesn't seem like, well, that's 379,000. That's a, that's a long time. If you said that the universe was the same age as you are, that means it's roughly 12 hours after you were conceived is when you're getting the image, the same parallel kind of structure. This is truly an, an image of the embryo universe. And I got excited about this and talked to my colleagues who are working on inflation saying, we've got evidence for inflation and we've got to study this and figure out what's going on. And that inflation is this tremendous acceleration that creates space-time at the beginning. And because it's happening so amazingly, it's driven by quantum mechanical fluctuations. There's a strong field that's driving it, but quantum mechanical fluctuations in that field, and then the actual fabric of space-time show up as these kind of objects. And the question is, what do we know about it? All right, well, before I get to that, here's Hubble. I used to laugh because Hubble would say, look how far we're looking, <laughs> you know, but it's true, they did look a lot further. So the Hubble Space Telescope, the Hubble Deep Field was looking out, you know, a billion years in the Hubble Deep Field, I mean, I'm sorry, from 13.7 billion years down to one billion years from the beginning of the universe, and the Hubble Ultra Deep Field was looking down to about half a million years, back to the, you know, where we at that time thought the first galaxies would be showing up. And so we have, I don't know if I have the laser. I can't, I don't see the laser. All right, well, never mind. So we have two sets of data. We have the cosmic background radiation telling us about stuff, and we have the Hubble telling us about stuff. It turns out we have ground-based astronomy too, but this is a set of things. And we can study that, and we find an amazing thing. Okay, so we find that the current universe is back to accelerating again. It accelerated amazingly fast in the early universe. Then it slowed down and slowed down in a long time. All that time it was slowing down, it was making structure. It was making galaxies and clusters of galaxies and planets and so forth. But then it started to pick up speed and go far faster. And then it can't make bigger objects. It can only continue to make the smaller objects that were already coming together. And so one of the things you can do is take the sets of data and you would see on these two plots, the cosmic microwave background, CMB, says the universe is close to flat, but not exactly flat to our best fitting to all our data. But you can add the new supernova data, which was the one where my colleagues, and Saul Permitter and uh, Adam Reese and so forth, the, they were looking to see if the universe was slowing down and how much, and they found that it was going faster in the more recent time. And so that says, okay, we need something that's the equivalent of negative, ener negative energy for, uh, for gravity so that the universe would speed up. And 
There are two sets. You can use clusters of galaxies, or you can use a thing called baryon acoustic oscillations. And the baryon acoustic oscillations are the things that we see when we look at the cosmic microwave background, because these perturbations in the universe, there's dark matter in there, and that starts to form the network and the framework in which the ordinary matter is going to fall into. But the light is so powerful in the early universe, it blows the dark matter up, and it blows it out in these huge, uh, huge waves. And uh, so we see that, and when we start doing the fit, we find the universe has a lot of interesting ingredients. But the ones we really like, or are our favorites, they're pretty insignificant. That is, everything in this room comes from a set of data which is less than two tenths of a, two hundredths of a percent of the energy budget of the universe. The dark energy is about 70%, two thirds to 70%. The dark matter that we, don't, we have going through the room, but we doesn't make structure in the room, makes up about 25%. And the free hydrogen and helium make up about 4%. And the stars are half a percent. All those things we're seeing out there, all those things astronomers are looking at, was less than 1% of what the universe fidget was. Just whatever. And uh, so we've got these now where we can fit, and I'll show you some examples. We know these things to about 1% now. We've made so much progress from not knowing at all to random guessing. We're now knowing most of these to better than 1%, some uh, even a tenth of a percent. And I just uh, flash this up because it's nice to show a picture of some of the people involved. but. Alexander Friedman, who was a meteorologist but great at math, actually took Einstein equations and simplified it by imagining a spherical symmetric universe and then derived these simple equations. But I, I won't go into these unless there's a question or something. Okay, but now here's what we do. We've got those kind of equations. We know what the universe is made out of. We can ask what's going to happen. I'm going to make these perturbations. They're going to be essentially independent of scale. They have an extremely small tilt, but extremely close to independent scale, from things that are hundreds of millions of light years all the way things down to this big. The fluctuations are all roughly the same. And that's kind of surprising. It could be tilted a little bit so that the average, you know, the RMS amplitude of these things is slightly different one than the other, but it can't be tilted by much. And so with COBE, we measured the, the figure at the top, right? That's the place that measures the sort of the primordial, the stuff that hasn't had time to oscillate in the 379,000 years. So it's pretty much the way it was when it came out of the beginning of the universe. Then we have the baryon acoustic oscillations I was talking about. The fact is the light is so powerful, it just essentially blows the electrons, and the electrons blow the protons and the helium nuclei and drag them with them, and they get spread all out. Later, when the universe becomes transparent, a lot of the dark matter pulls that back. But in the end, you'll see a little bit is left behind. There are these huge spherical surfaces left over of a teeny fraction of the gal extra galaxies that are out there. So now, the second one is the WMAP satellite. So we're starting to talk money here, because we're, you know, a satellite's not cheap, but now we're two satellites and pretty soon three satellites. Um, and you see it covered the next range, which showed the peak of these oscillations. And uh, oh, luckily it only shows here and not there. Um, it, it showed the peaks were such that it helped us measure in their displacement. It gives us an angular size. That tells us the triangle, triangle, triangle. We can measure the triangle. We can measure the sum of the angles you know, 180 degrees, and they're very close. So we know the answer for really big triangles. And, but it also, the relative heights of the peak, tell you how much dark matter there is, how, many, how much ordinary matter, and so forth. That's, that's one of the things we can fit to. And then we had Planck, which does, it seems like it's almost fresh to me, but it's been done now for two and a half years. It's the COVID kind of slowed down the stuff. We're still publishing some stuff. But, I don't know what's going on. And it measures the tail out. And let me show you what that looks like. Well, I guess I'm going to try this guy. Here are the data for the temperature variations and for 
the polarization variations. And you expect temperature variations, and if you illuminate electrons or your car hood or the, the bay non-uniformly, the scattering will give you polarization. So you see how many peaks we see. We're beginning to do spectral physics. There's a first peak, there's at least seven peaks, and if you want to be a believer, you can probably see out the nine or ten peaks and stuff like that. But then you look at the polarization, and you see a bunch of peaks in it, and if you look carefully, if you know to look for it, they're 90 degrees out of phase with the temperature ones. That's exactly what you predict should happen if you have these acoustic oscillations going on in the universe. So, hey, there's just one simple set of numbers we put in, the formula, and we get that curve that you see the data points sitting on. This is, you know, this is pretty amazing. I show you the, you know, how the fitting is done. You have the map. This particular one is a Planck map, which is 10 million pixels by 10 million pixels. It's a big computer problem, but you fit to this, this curve with all the data that you have, and you can fit to the six parameters. There should be nine total parameters, but there's only six of them that are affecting this part of the curve. And you can fit to them and get them, and now we're at the point where we're getting to better than 1% for all of them. That is, we know how much dark matter, we know how much this and so forth. And it's a, there's certain, this is progress. And I couldn't imagine 30 years ago when we first saw that curve, they were gonna get here so fast, but we got here really fast. And there are people doing what are called galaxy surveys. They're using t automated telescopes and going out and measuring the direction and the redshift to galaxies. And you have a number, uh, you know, a large number, this particular set of data is 120,000 galaxies. I'll show you the next thing, which is going to be 30 million galaxies. These observations are really a good fit to the cosmology model. You can see the predicted curve in terms of, unfortunately, wave number, but that's the number of times it oscillates on a given length. And you see the CMB in the red and the, the bumps going down. Then you see blue bumps going down. That's what you see in galaxy counts. You can see the spherical, the tiny residual, few percent residual of spherical galaxies out there. And so there are people now who want to measure those very precisely in order to measure other things going on because how that, those oscillations are going on at the end and everything determines some of the other factors. So there has been incredible amount of effort and work because we have seen the CMB made predictions of what's going on. People realized that the universe was simpler. We could make these measurements and test these models and really see what's going to happen next. Okay, so here's the one that's actually ongoing. And just about two days ago, even though I was tired and going to these meetings and going to the late dinner and everything, I got the email from them. Half of the first survey for, from the dark, the DAISY, which is the Dark Injury Spectroscopic Experiment, half of that is, is completed, that first survey. This is the one whose goal is to measure 30 million galaxies, measure the location very precisely, the brightness very precisely, and measure the redshift very precisely, and then fit to it. And you can see, oops, I can see it, but maybe you can't. We have been getting a sharper and sharper vision of what the universe looked like in this early time, and also a sharper vision of what's happening since then. And so, Kobe was in 1992, right? Some of you can do the math and realize that was 30 years ago that we got our results. WMAP was in 2003, that was 10 years later, so 20 years ago. And Planck was 2015 to 2018. We got a little bit more data, it took time to analyze it. But essentially, just before COVID really kicked in, we were in the downhill part of analyzing that data. And we approved from having a resolution of seven degrees to a third of a degree to a tenth of a degree. But there's a huge set of ground-based telescopes, much bigger because they're on the ground, uh, and you can do that, but on mountaintops and in, in places that are very good, that allow us to look on the finer scale. That's why we're able to see the peaks further and further out. And there is, nominally in 2027, but probably in 2030, uh, the Lightbird satellite coming along to try and do what I was talking about, looking for the signal we think there might be from the actual formation of space-time. 
we're seeing, the fluctuations we're seeing are all attributed to the thing that drew, drove this, the thing we call the inflaton, the inflation field. That's all the fluctuations we see. Down at maybe the 1% level of that, there are also quantum mechanical fluctuations in the metric of space-time. That means there will be a scalar part and a vector part and a tensor part. The tensor parts are, uh, when they come inside the horizon, are gravitational waves. Okay, so here are some of the experiments. You can see a picture of Planck in the bottom left and, uh, you know, a big, uh, telescope, a big uh, balloon telescope that got flown around Antarctica and uh, also other things from Antarctica. Those of you that were at the, the talk yesterday, you can see there's a whole station that's away from the old dome area and across the right, but there's a whole set of stations with telescopes and so forth. All of those are cosmic microwave background measuring experiments. It's quite incredible. That whole lab, now one of the things they learned is not to put a dome on the ice, but to put everything up so the ice crystals can blow underneath, and that, that saves uh, the amount of work. And on the top is a picture from the Chilean Andes. It's a very high, dry place, and it's a good place to make the measurements because it's atmosphere that causes this trouble. And so I was talking about the possible uh, polarization of the, micro, of the cosmic microwave background. And you can divide that polarization into two, two terms. One we call the E-mode. That is what you would get from something that's a scalar field. It points away from or points around, but it has no hand in this or anything else. And the other is a B-mode, which is what you can easily get from the tensor variations in the metric, because you need to have a direction and a polarization. You need two different directions in order to have it curve this way or have it curve that way. So you have to know this direction and you have to know this direction in order to make things work out. And so the pattern, the kind of patterns are shown in the color ones of a, what a V-mode and an E-mode would look like. But if you imagine the simplest possible E-mode shown here and you put it through gravitational lensing, it gets wiggled around a little bit. That means a little bit of the E modes get turned into B modes, the ones that are more complicated. And so that's the background, but it's also something we can predict to exist. And, okay, so this is a pretty picture with, with a lot of exaggeration. The light comes from the beginning of the universe, at least 379,000 379, years after it. And it comes through and it passes by clusters of galaxies and clusters of clusters of galaxies and even a few galaxies, and its light path is bent. This is shown very exaggerated. The light path bending is very small, and it twists the, the thing around a little bit, so you get a little bit of E mode from the, from the E mode of the polarization, but it also moves the temperature patterns a little bit. And so here is on the left a prediction of what the scalar perturbation should be, the stuff that comes from the infoton, the temperature variations, the cross correlation between the temperature and E modes, the E modes, and the B modes from the lensing of the E modes. All of that is a direct prediction from what we know from the measured, just Kobe normalization, you can predict all of this. And everything I'll show you, all the data come in and fit that. Look on that side and you see how precisely it fits to the, to the curves. The red curve is the theory of the red, and then there's a deviation because there's some extra sources because galaxies provide signals. Then you can see the E modes and you can see the lensing of the E modes and the B modes. These are observations. So it's the, it's the spectrum, it's the fine structure, and it's the hyperfine structure of, this, of the kind of spectrum and what's going on. Because if you look, we gain orders of magnitude between these, right? This is a power, you know, it's a log plot in terms of these things. There's a huge difference in the signal level. And if you look down here in this little tiny corner, that's the last place where the, B, the real B modes from tensors could show up. The temperatures are going well below. This plot, I'll show you the plot. This is the plot that Douglas and I made in 2015. The, I'll show you in a minute the plot that we just made should either be appearing on the preprint server. It, it's just been accepted for 
publication, so we were allowed to, to post it soon. And uh, we'll, we'll do that. But you can see that, and you can see the kind of data we might expect from the, the Japanese satellite. And you can see what the little bump you're looking for to see you know, the fluctuations in the, in the metric of space-time itself. And this is, the, this is the plot we put in the new one. We had to move all those things from the tensor modes down in order of magnitude because the experimental observations have pushed us down in order of magnitude. So we had to remake that plot and, and push it down to here, even though the one on, the, on, the, on, the, uh, on your right-hand side is, uh, no, your left-hand side, is, um, is all set for the, for the, by the Kobe normalization up in that upper left corner. It's uh, the stuff for the tensor mode isn't known yet. And this is already telling us that the energy scale of actual inflation is a two orders of magnitude lower, because it, you know, it goes as E squared or E fourth, depending on which thing you're looking at. Uh, the energy scale for inflation is at least two orders of magnitudes lower than the flatness of the amphiton potential, because they both create curvature fluctuations that are roughly the same size, but because the amphiton has a negative pressure, what's there is the delta rho over the density plus the pressure. If the pressure is minus the density, then there's a big amplification. And that's the thing that we're, we're arguing about. But it is, it is to me, you know, when we were doing this, finishing it up last month, I was just impressed by how steady the progress has been over the last years. And we also now can make a map of the lensing or average mass between the beginning of the universe and the present. And it's leveraged, so it actually weights the stuff near redshift to one more than us because it's the, it's the, the lensing kernel, you know, it's the two lever arms get, get weighted in there. But this is the kind of structure we see. It doesn't look like some strange material out there. This looks exactly like you would predict it would be in the simple cold dark matter model. And so it's, a, it's an interesting kind of phenomena. And this is just, you know, the last two years that we were able to make these kind of stuff by analyzing the data carefully. And so the cosmic microwave background for its own Moore's law, which I've been tracing for a long time. If you look on the right, it's the year. And on the vertical axis, it's the sensitivity of the detectors. And just like computers, the sensitivity detector came from improving the quantum mechanics of the sensors, but it also came from increasing the number of detectors. And if you look at the numbers up in that box, you'll see we've gone from having 100, you know, we used to do it with four detectors the very first time, then we did it with 100 detectors, then 1,000, 10,000, and the next stage is going to be 100,000 detectors. And that is actually going on. That is, that means you really find this rewarding in terms of what you're learning about the universe, that you can get the funding agencies to, to approve this. Okay, so CMBS4, going to have some aspects at the South Pole and some up in the Atacama Desert. And that's a whole sequence of stuff. It was supposed to happen earlier, but COVID pushed everything back a couple of years. And it's a really big collaboration now. And here's a picture of what the sites look like. So on the bottom, you see the South Pole, it's flat ice, but it's almost two kilometers above the sea level because the ice is thick. And uh, up there is the top of a mountain in Chile. Why do we do this? Well, it's clouds. Clouds can ruin your data. So where on the earth is the water vapor above your head the least? Well, it turns out the South Pole, the Atacama Desert, and the high, Ch you know, high Chilean Andes, that's why a huge number, roughly half of all the new telescopes are being put there, because it's Chilean government. There's a plateau in Tibet, which is behind in the rain shadow of the stuff. And Greenland used to be that way, but we're seeing climate change affect Greenland, so it's not clear whether something will be done there or not. But our Chinese colleagues are building a huge astronomical site there, including a CMB one. So you can see India down to the bottom. You can see the Himalayas and Tibet above that, and you can see where the site is on the second mountain range behind the Himalayas. And uh, here's what it looks like. They're putting in 
the first generation CMB measurements already before COVID shut everything down, but they're also building a number of very large optical telescopes. And uh, so, and they built infrastructure. And this is the amazing thing. I was invited to go up with them, but I didn't. You can see the Himalayas in the background. These guys went up there. They're set at 4, 000, over 4,000 meters. It's almost 5,000 meters. That's, you know, I have to get in shape before I go there, but I'm not going to go there right away because things haven't settled down. Okay. And why do you do that? Well, here's a situation where we're doing Earth-centered coordinates. So the galaxy is this snake, this sort of snake shape. You want to be able to look where the galaxy is not giving you a lot of trouble. So this is what the galaxy looks like in polarized signal. This is what the galaxy looks like in dust signal um, based on the Planck satellite. You can see where you want to make your observations, right? You, you, you can't just look because you can't do it right across the plane of the galaxy. So this is stuff that's going on. The JAXA, I have at 2027, I think it's going to slide back for the, because of COVID and so forth to 2030, but we'll see. But this is a relatively small satellite. When I say relatively small, it's four and a half meters across in the, in the shutter. So it's, it's a small satellite compared to what we have on the ground. I mean, it's small compared to what we have on the ground, but it's, it's still a pretty impressive thing. And so the Japanese are doing it. Ah, I need to get my, I wonder if my thing will charge this computer. I don't think so. Um, anyway, uh, they're paying for it, but they have taken worldwide collaborators. And uh, so this is making a lot of progress. Okay, now there are gravity waves, which are new kids on the block, and I don't have time to. So gravity waves, have been a great discovery and there's a lot of interesting stuff. My colleagues at the DIPC and I have actually been writing a series of papers claiming that some of the amazing things that LIGO claims they're discovering and seeing are actually the fact that they're seeing gravitational lens gravity wave events that, you know, just like you can gravitationally lens light, you can gravitationally lens, uh, you know, gravity waves. And so there are some things that fall in the exotic window. If you look across here in the graveyard for stars, you will see there are some purple things across there, which are the known black holes from electromagnetic measurements, you know, regular astronomy kind of stuff. And the ones that LIGO is seeing, and some are much brighter, that happens if you get ma you know, lensing. The mass looks larger because they solve for it as being closer, therefore it should you know, be whatever it is, because the amplitude goes up. And the same thing is true about the neutron star masses. If, they're, if the neutron star, neutron star black hole are, are, are lens, they will make it look like the, the, the neutron star is heavier than it is. Whereas we know that in most of these systems, it's about a 1.4 solar mass. Okay. So anyway, that's one of the exciting things that I do with my DPIC colleagues. But we have a really big project with the James Webb Space Telescope. And the James Webb Telescope is big. That little thing at the end is, about, is taller than a human. This is big. I mean, it's quite big. They're going, in order to see further, going to the infrared because light is stretched. And in order to keep your angular resolution good, you've got to make your telescope bigger because it's the wavelength divided by the diameter of the telescope. That's the thing that matters. So it's huge. And it had to be unfolded. These things are actually were folded up inside the space shuttle, and when it went out, they all unfolded in this really complicated big structure. And here's the kind of thing. On the left is a set of four galaxies. There's actually five, but four you see. A picture taken by Hubble, and you can see it, and it's interesting. But on the right, you can see the JWST image of the same thing. You see different things in the galaxies emphasized because it's looking in the infrared rather than the, in the visible light. But you see a huge number of galaxies in the background and uh, that we can see. So we started a project and we have some graduate students and postdocs here and in Hong Kong and then have collaborators all around the world to get data by looking through a bunch, a cluster, a set of clusters of galaxies. So we picked out a set of seven clusters of galaxies and JWST goes and observes. And what you're trying to do is see a situation where a background galaxy is imaged, gravitationally imaged by that, so you gain 
a lot of intensity and stuff, it magnifies the faraway objects and you can detect it much more easily. And so we're, we're, we're doing that and we're part way in it. Uh, they keep releasing the bunch of data, so a lot of people are writing papers. I said that's bad for the postdocs and the grad students because they need to learn how to do it you know, correctly and effectively, not rush the publication. But they're doing it and they're having good experience from it. And one of our colleagues here, who's a professor at, at uh, UPV also, uh, actually put out a press release uh, through the UPV some time ago about how quantum mechanics could be really impressive on the galactic scale. If you had extremely ultralight particles, you could have formations of scales of 10 to the 80 or 10 to 200 particles condensed into Bose, you know, Bose-Einstein states. And they will have, if they're a very low mass, like 10 to the minus 20, 10 to minus 21 EV, they will have a wavelength, a de Broglie wavelength, which is comparable to, this, to the core of our galaxy. And then they will have other stuff. So you will see waves. And so you see in this plot these waves where you're seeing the de Broglie wavelength, and then the whole thing is going up and down to the Compton uh, time. And, but at the core, there is a single soliton of really massive uh, Bose-Einstein constant. Now, the thing that's exciting about that, or maybe not exciting about that, is that it predicts a lot of some of the things that we're seeing, but it also predicts that the first generation of galaxies should be a little slower to form than you do with ordinary cold dark matter. So there's a plot sort of in blue there that shows you wave dark matter and cold dark matter with the same initial perturbations and how it, it, it goes. And on the big scale, they don't look different. It's only on the fine scale where you see, you see the little de Broglie wavelength waves across the, the, the structure. And so I'm uh, trying to convince Tom to keep a really open eye to the fact that maybe we're learning something because we have found some really early galaxies. And by really early galaxies, I'm saying, if you look at the one here on the left, it's from a redshift of 10, according to the first spectral measurements. That is really early. You know, the wave dark matter say they really shouldn't be but a very few that early. You know, maybe we're really lucky, or maybe it's something else that's forming the galaxies we have to see. Uh, the one below, it's at a redshift of 11, right? That means the universe was 12 times smaller than it is today when that galaxy light started to us. And you can see the other two, they're, they're also pretty impressive. What does it mean? Well, we don't know. We're still trying to understand it because we're trying to understand, did they get it right? Did we do it? But it is surprising that if the galaxies are forming this early because some of them have already gone through their first generation of stars and have produced their first generation of elements. So it's really surprising. It doesn't throw the Big Bang into trouble, but it throws our understanding of how galaxies form into, uh, up in the air. Okay, so this I'm going to skip over because we had a talk by TDA um, on how you can look at the planet's atmosphere with JWST and you can actually try and look to see signs of life. Right? So we really have an idea about the history of the universe and we make predictions and we fit parameters and we design experiments to go and test it. So far, so good. There's a little controversies about various things, but not so much. And there's a whole lot of stuff going on. There's the, the spectroscopic survey. There's the Varan, you know, there's just a whole bunch of things coming on. And Euclid Space Mission is already launched. They're just doing checkout now. It's gonna, it's gonna work. And there's, there's a whole lot of new experiments that are coming on right now. And so I thought I would come to an end here because I've run way over. <laughs> However, you know, quantum mechanics actually plays a big role in the universe in a in a lot of surprising ways. And if, if the wave dark matter is the thing that's the dark matter, it's, that's also quite surprising. But in fact, it's clear the universe is a really big effective computer. If you look at a number of different things, they tell you it's got an incredible frame rate, almost a Planck time, a few Planck time. It's able to be doing in the next Calculate and so forth. And one of the things we know is the connectedness, the quantum connectedness of individual places, individual events, 
put together it creates the fabric of space in a certain sense and it makes makes a defined geometry so it is quite there's other evidence is quite possible the universe itself is a huge quantum computer and the question is how would you ever program that you know what if your job was you had to program the the universe to give you a really good simulation of something you want to see so that's what i'm going to end now because i ran over <laughs>